Good, good evening, friends. And as and when we connect with Justice Hari Prashad, now a designated senior, we always find that his journey is always fruitful. The last time we met, he had been recently designated. Now we find him in the new office. So it seems that it is not only lucky for Beyond Law, but it also seems to be very lucky for Justice Hari Prashad, a senior advocate. And though, though the topic for today is different types of remands under the CPC, but I would say that remand and demand are a common connotation. And we may not have a remand, but there's always a demand of Justice Hari Prashad for sharing his knowledge. And being a weekend, he had a tight schedule. He had to go in the evening as well as for tomorrow. But his dedication for the fraternity is immense. And that keeps us not only him going, but also the team of Beyond Law CLC. So we wish that this office churns out the best of the legal brains and it helps in the legal empowerment of the society, not only through the YouTubes with the channels like Beyond Law CLC, but also all other platforms because we know that you are immensely popular amongst the masses as well as classes. Here I will connote masses and classes would mean the legal fraternity and legal minds and legal mindsets. Without taking further time, I would request sir to share his knowledge. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, my dear Vikas, for the kind words. I don't know whether I deserve such an appreciation. Anyway, I'm extremely happy that uh, you are very kind enough to uh, uh, acknowledge my humble uh, attempt to do service to the legal fraternity to the extent possible at my level. Yes, good evening to all my dear friends. Now, today we are going to see what are the different types of remand orders possible under the Code of Civil Procedure 1908. And at the outset, I may say that the remand of a case is not a good thing, either from the perspective of a judge or from the perspective of a lawyer or from the perspective of a litigant, because it will give some sort of a further lease of life or prolongation of life of a, an old litigation. So generally, the remands are considered not as a favorable thing, or rather it is viewed with uh, some sort of dislike. But then there can be situations uh, in the real life where a remand becomes inevitable in a litigation. So let us see what are the provisions relating to remand of a case from an appellate court to the lower court or to the trial court uh, in an inevitable situation. Before going into the subject, we all know that the order of remands are passed by the appellate courts. So that takes us to another question. What, what do you mean by an appeal? Uh, the word appeal has been held to mean the removal of a cause from an inferior court to a superior court uh, for the purpose of testing the soundness of the decision of the inferior court. So it is appellate court is a touchstone where the soundness of the decision of the inferior court is tested. And you complain to a higher court saying that, look here, the trial court committed a grave error either on facts or on law or both. And uh, therefore, I am aggrieved. So appeal is a is a is a what you call is a request to the higher court to re-examine the whole thing. That is applicable in the case of first appeal. We are concerned with the first appeal for the time being because second appeal, as you know, section 100 CPC says a substantial question of law should be churned out. Now, those are all different aspects in which we may not go in the present day because this is not our subject. So appeal is a request by a, a person aggrieved by the decision of an inferior court requesting the appellate court to look to test the soundness of the decision taken by the trial court. Then, then the question, what is the nature of appeal? Is it a constitutional right? Is it a natural right? Is it a common law right? I will repeatedly saying in many platforms that appeal is affirmatively held to be a statutory right. If any statute in CPC, we find section 96 onwards regarding the uh, appeals from decrees and judgments. And in uh, 104, appeals from uh, interlock inter orders, appeal from orders permitted under order, order 43 and uh, section 104. So appeal, normally it is only a creation of a statute and there is no inherent right or a common law right or a constitution right to file an appeal. 
But in the case of a suit, as all of us know, suit is a right because the first action is a right. Whether an appeal should be filed or not is to be decided with reference to the statute under which you claim the first relief. So that is also settled law. I am just making, uh, I am just refreshing your uh, memory regarding the right of appeals. I don't think I, I need not burden you with uh, uh, decisions on these points because platina, uh, cathora, uh, plethora of decisions are available. Uh, I don't want to burden that. And uh, as all of us know, who can appeal? A person aggrieved who is a party to a suit or proceeding and aggrieved by the decision can file an appeal if the statute permits. Or a person, though he is not a party to the proceedings, but is adversely affected by the decree or judgment, then he can also file an appeal, but only condition is that such person should obtain the leave of the court. In the case of a party, no leave is required. First appeal is a matter of almost a right. Because first appeal, appellate court's jurisdiction, all of us know, is coterminous, coextensive, and coterminous to that of the trial court. It begins at the same point, ends at the same point. Powers of appellate court and trial court starts from the same point and then ends at the same point. That is why we say that it is coterminous and coextensive and coterminous. So that is clear from section 107. Subject to correction, one minute, please. Yes. Section 107, subsection 2 says, subject as aforesaid, the appellate court shall have the same powers and shall perform as nearly as may be the same duties as are conferred and imposed by this court on the courts of original jurisdiction in respect of suits instituted therein. So the powers of appellate court starts from the same point where the trial court's power starts and it ends at the same point where the trial court's power ends. That is the spirit uh, in the uh, in sections 107 2. Then, then regarding powers of appellate court, first part of section 107 says that subject to such conditions and limitations as may be prescribed, uh, an appellate court shall have power a to determine a case finally. So that is, it is not, according to me, it is not a power. It is a duty of the appellate court to determine the case finally. If everything is, uh, every, uh, every, what you call, uh, evidence is brought before the court and the records are perfect, then it is the duty of the court. It is neither, it is, uh, it is actually rather than a power, it is a duty of the court to decide the case finally. Then B, remand a case. So this is an incident of appellate power. Remanding a case is an is an exercise of appellate jurisdiction. And C, to frame issues and refer them for trial. That is called, loosely it is said, issue remand. But actually it is only a reference of one issue for the determination. We shall, we shall see those aspects later in detail. Then D, to take additional evidence or to require such evidence to be taken. So generally going by CPC section 107.1, there are four powers conferred by the court on an appellate court, one to determine the case finally, two to remand the case, three to frame issues and refer them for trial, and four to take additional evidence or require such evidence to be taken by a court inferior to the appellate court, generally the trial court. So these are the four powers available to an appellate court. These introductions I am just making for the purpose of appreciating the scope of remand orders and the nature of remand orders and also in which cases remand should be allowed because as I told you in the opening sentence, uh, in the opening uh, this uh, this lecture, I, I told you that uh, remand is causing a further delay of disposal of the case, causing difficulty to litigants, causing pendant, increase in pendency, because uh, I believe the, the legal fraternity and the judicial officers will be benefited by uh, considering these points, which I want to tell you right now today. Uh, so that both sides uh, will appreciate both judicial officers and the lawyers will be should be benefited by my presentation that's my wish that's why i uh, uh, view things from two perspectives from the judge's perspective as well as from the lawyer's perspective then another philosophy in the cpc you will find in section 99 which says section 99 says uh, no decree shall be reversed or substantially varied, nor shall any case be remanded in appeal on account of any misjoinder or non-joinder of parties or causes of action or any error 
defect or irregularity in any proceedings in the suit not affecting the merits of the case or the jurisdiction of the court. So such matters like, uh, like um, non-joinder of parties, non-joinder of cause of action or any error, defect, etc. shall not be a reason uh, either to reverse a decree or to vary the decree substantially nor to remand a case to the lower court if these, uh, these defects do not affect the decision of the case on merits or it does not affect the jurisdiction of the court. Now, when these two conditions are not satisfied, all these defects do not affect the jurisdiction of the court, these defects do not affect the merit of the uh, finding of the court, then the appellate court should affirm the decree, that is the philosophy in section 99. So, all these provisions would eloquently proclaim that to the extent possible, the, uh, the appellate court should perform its duty of deciding the case in accordance to law and facts in a given case and remand is only a very rare exception to the general rule. And in section 99, you will find uh, uh, one Supreme Court decision, it's a classic decision, thereafter it is followed in many decisions, A.R. 1954, Supreme Court 340 which says that it's a salutary statute, sorry, it is a salutary rule of law. It aims to prevent technicalities from overcoming the ends of justice. That is what the Supreme Court in year 54, Supreme Court 340 says, which is followed by Kerala High Court in year 1979, Kerala, page one, full bench. 79, Kerala, full bench, page one, full bench. So, now these are the general uh, uh, aspects regarding the appellate power. No, of course, there are other aspects which may not be relevant for our purpose. So I'm skipping those aspects. Then, then coming to uh, the, directly coming to the provisions dealing with the uh, remand, we will find uh, those provisions in order 41, rule 23 and rule 23 capital A. 23 capital A was added by 1976 amendment. Before that only 23 was there. 23 is a situation where uh, the suit is disposed on a preliminary point. And if the appellate court finds that the decision on the preliminary point is not correct and the suit should be fully tried. It shall not be disposed of on a preliminary point. If such a fine, if, a, if the appellate court feels on the materials available in the records that the disposal of the suit on a preliminary point was bad, then it can set aside the decree passed by the court below and remand the case for a de novo trial in respect of all the issues arising in the suit. I shall, for clarity, I shall just take you to the uh, relevant provision, Order 41, Rule 23. It will be good that we read uh, that provision. It's a very small provision which says like this. Where the court from whose decree an appeal is preferred has disposed of the suit upon a preliminary point and the decree is reversed in appeal, the appellate court may, if it thinks fit, by order remand the case and may further direct what issue or issues shall be tried in the case or remanded and shall send a copy of its judgment and order to the court from whose decree the appeal is preferred with directions to readmit the suit under its original number in the register of civil suits and proceed to determine the suit and the evidence if any recorded during the original trial shall subject to just all just exceptions be evidence during the trial after remand. So the provision is very clear. If a suit is decided on a preliminary point by the trial court, and if the appellate court on reconsideration of the materials placed before it in the form of appeal and the records, if it is of opinion that the disposal of the case on a preliminary point was not legally correct and not sustainable, then it shall set aside the decree and direct the court below to try the issues which are which arise in the case uh, and also to readmit the suit in the same original number as it was uh, as it was numbered when it was pending before the trial court and to reconsider the case. So if you read order 41 rule 23, you will find there are two conditions required for applying the rule. 
one where trial court has disposed of the suit upon a preliminary point and the decree is reversed in appeal so the disposal must be on a preliminary point not a full fledged trial and full fledged answering all the issues no only one issue for example i'll elaborate that for example there is a suit suit on a promissory note filed and the contention of the defendant is that it is the suit is barred by limitation whereas the plaintiff would say that the no there is no bar of limitation because the the liability has been acknowledged uh, by a writing under section 18 of the limitation act and if the court finds without looking into the acknowledgement part if the trial court finds that yes the pro note is beyond the suit is beyond 3 years from the date of promissory note and the acknowledgement was not considered at all or it was wrongly considered and on that sole issue of limitation suppose the suit is disposed of the appeal filed by in the appeal filed by the plaintiff he can establish before the appellate court that the disposal was wrong because the court below committed a grave mistake in appreciating the case based on law and fact so in that even probably a remand may be required in such situations likewise suppose there is a question of jurisdiction suppose a suit is filed before a, a, a court it's a, a, suit, a suit under a special statute which provides a special forum for disposal of such cases for example rent control legislations in our state rent control courts are different from uh, junior civil and junior division that is municipal court they are different from rent control court there is a separate authority suppose an eviction petition wrongly filed as a suit before a rent control court then the uh, the the suit is defective for lack of inherent lack of jurisdiction if uh, the the aggrieved person files an appeal and establishes before the court below that the particular area is not covered by the rent control act or the rent control act is not applicable to a particular class of building and the court below committed a grave mistake in finding that it has no jurisdiction then and if the appellate court finds that it had jurisdiction it uh, failed to consider its jurisdiction then the decree can be set aside and it can be sent back for a decision on merits in respect of all issues arising in the suit so these are the two situations where the trial court has disposed of the suit upon a preliminary point and the decree is reversed in appeal two where the appellate court in reversing or setting aside the decree considers it necessary in the interest of justice to remand the case because if if decree is reversed uh, then certainly if there is no trial in respect of other matters certainly in the interest of justice there should be a full fledged trial so it, the inevitable it is inevitable to have a remand that is its condition in situation in order 41 rule 23 <coughs> The appellate court also have a power to direct what issue or its issues shall be tried by the trial court and it shall send a copy of the appellate judgment for guidance of the trial court. And in this context, I may take directly to section 105 of the CPC, which says that uh, 105 subsection 2, notwithstanding anything contained in subsection 1, because subsection 1 is regarding the uh, uh, appellate jurisdiction that of course not for our purpose notwithstanding anything contained in subsection 1 where any party agreed by an order of remand from which an appeal lies does not appeal therefrom he shall thereafter be precluded from disputing its correctness so when an order of remand is made either under order 41 223 or 23 a if the agreed party does not challenge the order of remand in an appeal if appeal is permitted then such party will be precluded from debarred from uh, questioning the correctness of the remand order at a later point of time. Even in the appeal, he can't, in the first appeal, he can't uh, question the correctness of the remand order. So that is a, a cognate provision. I just wanted to bring that fact to your notice. Maybe it is actually connected provision. That's why 105.2 is brought to your notice. So this is order 41, rule 23. And then the question, one question may arise, what is a preliminary point? What do you mean by a preliminary point? Preliminary point is a point where, whereby a decision thereon will render a final decision in the entire suit. So once you take a decision on a particular point, if, the, if that causes the disposal of the entire suit, then such point is called a preliminary point. For example, question of limitation. Once, because you know section 3 of the limitation act says the question of limitation has to be decided as a preliminary point. If that is decided and it is found to be, the suit is found to be barred by law of limitation, then that is the end of the suit. 
Such points are called preliminary points. Anybody having any interest may refer to AR 1922 Madras. It's a very old decision. AR 1922 Madras 505 full bench, which clearly says a point can be said to be a preliminary point if it is such that the decision thereon in a particular way is sufficient to dispose of the whole suit without the necessity for a decision on other points in the case. So such points are called preliminary points. That is what is dealt with in order of article 223. Then another principle uh, to be remembered in this context is that the order of remand, power to exercise the uh, remand is a discretionary power. It rests with the court to find out whether uh, a, a discretion should be exercised in favor of a party or not. That's a discre judicial discretion available to the uh, appellate court. And of course, as guided, uh, as laid out by the uh, Supreme Court, the discretion has to be exercised sparingly, cautiously, and with a circumspection, and it should be judicially exercised. That is what, uh, judiciously exercised, sorry. AER 1988 Supreme Court 2123. A year 1988 Supreme Court 2123. Same principle stated in A year 76 Supreme Court 866. So then, then probably I, I might just illustrate some situations where a remand becomes inevitable. Normally, I told you at the outset that remands are not looked upon with favor by the higher courts because remand will only cause. Uh, this uh, extension of uh, litigation, rather prolongation of litigation and causing loss, pecuniary loss, time loss to litigants and uh, docket explosion to the courts. So always remand orders are not appreciated, but then there may be some certain situations, compelling situations where remand will have to be resorted to. Such situations in the life uh, example, we can say when the appellate court directs amendment of the pleadings, suppose there is a request before the appellate court for the first time to uh, amend, allow the parties, one of the parties, either the plaintiff or the defendant, to uh, amend the pleadings. And the amendment is, uh, is established to be or uh, proved to be for a valid reason. It could not be done due in the trial for such and such reason. If it is established that the amend is, uh, the, the amendment is highly essential for the proper adjudication of the case, then the appellate court has no other go but to allow the amendment. If such an amendment is allowed, probably in some many situations, a further uh, adducing evidence may be required, for which it may not be possible for the appellate court normally, because, because of the pendency of matters and other things, it may not be possible for an appellate court to record evidence and uh, re allow the parties to re-agitate. Moreover, the party may also lose one forum of appeal if that is done by the appellate court itself. So in that event, the appellate court has no other option but to remand the case. That is one situation. Then probably uh, then addition of parties. Suppose fresh parties are added. They were omitted to be added and one contention of non joint was raised in the first uh, opportunity itself. And if they are added here for the first time, showing valid reasons, then also the there is no trial in respect of those additional parties for which a trial becomes mandatory, then a remand also becomes essential. Now there may be myriad of situations like this uh, where a remand will be compelled to do. Otherwise, remand is not, not, that is not a routine. It is not a rule. It is only an exception. Then, another principle is that once an order of remand is made by the appellate court to the trial court or the inferior court, whatever it is, uh, then, uh, because in the case of a high court remanding, it can be to the first appellate court or to the trial court. So, uh, the, the, the order of remand should direct specifically as to which court has to deal with the case, depending on the fact situation and legal issue involved in each case. And uh, the order compliance, it is the bounded duty of the inferior court to comply the directions in the remand order. It cannot question the remand order. It cannot, it cannot uh, what you call, disobey the directions in the remand order. Okay. So 1970 Supreme Court Digest 353. The court to which a case is remanded cannot go behind the order of remand because it is guide, it should be guided by the directions in the remand order. It cannot go behind the order of remand. So this is the 
uh, these are the principles relating to remand generally and uh, specific to uh, rule 23. Now coming to 23 capital A, order 41 rule 23 capital A, that deals with the situation which is not covered by rule 23 because we, we have seen in rule 23 that it is a case where remand may be necessary in a given case when the case is disposed on a preliminary issue. But 23A deals with other situations which was added by the uh, 1976 amendment. Which say, like, says like this, uh, where the court from whose decree an appeal is preferred has disposed of the case otherwise than on a preliminary point, and the decree is reversed in appeal and a retrial is considered necessary, the appellate court shall have the same powers as it has under Rule 23. So, 23A comes into play when the suit is disposed not on a preliminary point after a full fledged trial, and the appellate court finds that uh, that the decree has to be reversed. It is defective for some reason. And not merely reversal of a decree is not, remand of a case is not automatic on reversal of a decree. It can either uh, reverse the decree and uh, allow the suit or dismiss the suit. So every reversal need not result in a remand. But the appellate court should find that the decree cannot be sustained. It should be reversed. That is the first finding. Second finding is that there was no trial in respect of a particular issue or in respect of a particular contention. Though an issue has been cast in the case, it was not properly tried. And a retrial of that aspect is highly essential for the proper uh, judicious adjudication of the case. Then it has to be remanded, even if it is decided not on a preliminary point covering all the points. So that is 23A. So to attract 23A, there must be two situations. The, uh, rather three situations. One, the suit must have been disposed not on a preliminary point after considering every issues arising and a full-fledged trial. Two, the appellate court should disagree with the finding of the court below and uh, it should arrive at a finding that a reversal of the decree is essential. Things do not stop there because every reversal may not result in a remand. And uh, thirdly, it must be established that there was no effective trial in respect of a particular aspect and the parties suffer prejudice on account of that, a retrial of uh, that is required, then the court has no other option but to remand the case. So this is the split up uh, uh, aspects involved in the Rule 23, involved in Rule 23A. Supreme Court says, a retrial is to be ordered under Rule 23 capital A only in cases where there has not been a proper trial by reason of something done by the court. Because it may be a mistake on the part of the court. So parties shall not suffer for that. 1988 Supplement SCC 171. 1988 Supplement SCC 171. An order of remand under Rule 23 is generally called an open remand. Then there can be a restricted remand also possible. But generally, these are all open remand because the whole case is open before the court below. In the case of 23, suppose the preliminary issue uh, was uh, preliminary point was decided by the uh, trial court in one way, and the appellate court reverses the preliminary point and directs a retrial. There cannot be a further decision on a prelim on the preliminary point by the trial court. So, in that sense, it is a restricted remand. Because preliminary point, when a suit is decided on a preliminary point and other issues are not answered, you can seek a remand under Order 41 Rule 23. And if the appellate court is convinced that the decision on the preliminary point is incorrect and it set, sets aside and directs the court below to try the other issues, insofar as the finding in respect of the preliminary point is concerned, that is final. And the trial court cannot reconsider that preliminary point because it has been answered by the appellate court. Remaining points will have to be considered by the trial courts. That is why it is in some decisions you will find an expression restricted remand. Now, these are all uh, judge made of observations, and uh, CPC doesn't say so. Then, another type of remand is Rule 25. It is not actually a remand, it is a reference of an issue for trial. 
though loosely some decisions use the expression remand actually if you read rule 25 you will understand that it is only a what you call a reference for answering an issue i shall just read that provision where the court from whose decree the appeal is preferred has omitted to frame or try any issue omitted to frame or try any issue or to determine any question of fact which appears to the appellate court essential to the right decision of the suit upon merits the appellate court may if necessary frame issues and refer the same for trial to the court from whose decree the appeal is preferred and in such case shall direct such court to take additional evidence required and such court shall proceed to try such issues and shall return the evidence to the appellate court together with the findings thereon and the reasons therefore within such time as may be fixed by the appellate court or within the extended time from time to time. So an issue, suppose an issue has not been framed by the trial court which arises out of pleadings going by order 14 CPC. If an issue which uh, actually arises but not considered by the court below or if an issue has been properly framed but not answered properly not considered or answered and then no evidence there was no trial in respect of that issue then the appellate court on finding that such a matter is uh, such a grave in, uh, irregularity has been committed by the trial court it can refer that issue either by framing itself or the already framed issue can be directed to be retried by allowing the parties to adduce evidence on the issue in respect of that issue and then here the appellate court can direct the trial court to enter a finding on that issue and both the evidence and the finding shall be retransmitted to the appellate court till then the appeal will be kept on the file of the appellate court so there is no disposal of appeal the difference between order 41 rule 23 and 23a on one hand and rule 25 on the other hand is that in the case of 23 and 23a remand the case is disposed by the appellate court Whereas in the case of Rule 25, I mean, uh, this issue reference, the appellate court retains the appeal and directs the court below either by framing an issue or asking them to uh, allow the party to uh, adduce evidence in respect of an issue already framed by the trial court. And after recording evidence on that issue, uh, the, uh, the court below will be obliged to uh, enter, enter a finding on that uh, issue. And then that will be retransmitted to the appellate court. And the correctness of that finding will be considered along with the other matters in the appeal. So the appellate jurisdiction is retained. The appellate brief, the, the case is retained in the appellate court in 25 remand. But in other cases, the case will be over in, so insofar as appellate court is concerned. That is the essential difference between these uh, remands in the CPC. <clears throat> then, in the case of a remand, <laughs> The appellate court is bound to fix a date for appearance of parties before the court below because otherwise they will have to issue a summons again. That will be a cumbersome procedure, waste of time, waste of money. So uh, 26A says where the appellate court remands a case under Rule 23 or 23 capital A or frames issues and refers them for trial under Rule 25, it shall fix a date for the appearance of the parties before the court from whose decree the appeal was preferred for the purpose of receiving the directions of that court as to further proceedings in the suit. So there should be a, a what you call date fixed by the appellate court uh, for appearance of parties before the first court after remand because uh, otherwise it will uh, be a, a, a unnecessary exercise of issuing summons by the trial court again. So these are the provisions relating to remand in the CPC <clears throat> and uh, there are decisions by the Supreme Court deprecating the frivolous remands because uh, yeah, before that before that I'll, I'll take you to 24 also rule 24 or 41 rule 24 where the evidence upon the record is sufficient to enable the appellate court to pronounce judgment the appellate court may after resettling the issues if necessary finally determine the suit notwithstanding that the judgment of the court from whose decree the appeal is preferred has proceeded wholly upon some ground other than that on which the appellate court proceeds. Now, if there are complete evidence available in the case records, and maybe there may be some mistake in the uh, framing of issues or rather approach by the trial court, but if appellate court is satisfied that the entire, there, are, there are complete evidence available in respect of the dispute between the parties, then it is the duty of the appellate court to decide the case by itself without resorting to the 
uh, exercise of power of man. That is the spirit of 24, rule 24, which we have already seen in the substantive section there. So these are the, uh, the statutory provisions regarding uh, remand of the, uh, this judgments or cases to the court below. Then uh, now there are there are decisions by the Supreme Court on this point which say that remand is the last resort. As I told you earlier, this is the reason is that it will give a, a unnecessary lease of life to the uh, litigation. Already we are we, there is a the complaint against the judiciary both against the bar and against the bench is that uh, the, we are contributories for delaying the uh, uh, end result of a litigation. So remand should be resorted to only when it is in a, when it is a, a compelling reason for that. Uh, then then uh, after remand, unless the order of remand is challenged, the, the, the court to which it is remanded is bound to obey the directions in the order of remand and decide the case afresh depending on the nature of remand, whether it is an open remand or a restricted remand. Restricted remand in the sense some issues have already been concluded. That cannot be re-agitated before the trial court. In the case of an open remand, entire issues become open before the trial court and they can re you know, the parties can re-agitate the matter before the trial court. Depending on the nature of uh, order of remand, the parties will have to adduce evidence and the court, the trial court will have to take a decision. Again, maybe subject to an appeal as provided in order 41. That is why I say that uh, it will only prolong the life of a litigation. So these are the aspects relating to uh, remand of cases in appeal and uh, which, is, uh, uh, an, uh, uh, which is an appendage of appellate power available to appellate court which shall be exercised very sparingly and it is a discretionary power. It should be exercised with sound judicial reasons. And with these word, few words, probably I can stop it here because I'll over to you because if any questions. Yes, sir. Thank you. So since it was a short topic and uh, self-explanatory, we have not received any questions on the very chat good. as well as on the YouTube. Very but uh, since sometimes people go in at the end, how would you like to sum it up the remand. Uh, the order of remand, if I am asked to sum, uh, su uh, what do you call it? Sum up the, Summarize it. Summarizing. Now, the remand is a, an in inseparable or a very valuable power of an appellate court, which shall be exercised only very sparingly. It is not a matter of right to seek a remand or grant a remand. It is not an easy job for a judge to see that uh, one case is disposed of in some way. No. He shall be, he shall do, uh, he, he shall apply his judicial mind and uh, think about the sad plight of a litigant before remanding a case that it will give rise to another 10 years or 5 years depending on the pendency in court a lease of life for a litigation again then again another round of appeal so these are miseries we shall not add as lawyers and as judges we shall not add miseries to litigants we are supposed to uh, what you call uh, uh, to give assuage to them not to trouble them so uh, remand is a discretionary relief. It shall be very sparingly exercised. And uh, two types of remand. One is uh, open remand under Order 41 Rule 23 capital A and uh, restricted remand under Order 41 Rule 23 when, a, when the suit is disposed on a preliminary point. And 23A deals with a remand when it is disposed on, uh, not on a preliminary point, means other issues also considered. And if the court finds that there was no trial in respect of any issue, then it, the remand is inevitable. And there may be compelling situations, uh, unavoidable situations like addition of parties, amendment of pleadings, where remand may be inevitable. In other cases, it shall not be granted for a for mere asking. That is my advice to all parties concerned. Yes, sir. So uh, I think people will understand the nitty gritties of remand as nicely explained by you. And thank you, everyone. Stay safe and stay blessed. Now, one question per chance has come. Is the trial court entitled to dispose of a suit only considering a preliminary point without answering the other issues? Yes, it can. Because suppose the question of limitation is raised. As you know, Section 3 of the Limitation Act says whether a limitation, whether the question of limitation is taken as a defense or not, the court is bound to consider whether the, plea, the, the suit is barred by limitation. Suppose the, there are 10 issues and first issue is regarding the question of limitation. The trial court finds that the suit is hopelessly barred then it has no jurisdiction to decide other issues. 
you can't decide uh, other issues in a suit which is found to be hopelessly barred by limitation. So there is no chance, there is no scope for answering other issues and this suit will be disposed out only on a preliminary point of limitation. So it can be disposed in a given case. Yeah. Even on, uh, otherwise, rejection of plaint could also come into that. Rejection of, plaint, uh, rejection of plaint is a different situation because it is you can file another suit in the same court provided law of limitation permits. Order 7 rule 11 says that once rejection of plaint, rule 13 says that if law of limitation permits, you can file another suit without these defects and uh, you can, there is no bar or you can file an appeal on that rejection of uh, this thing, uh, plaint. No, no, his question was, is the trial court entitled to dispose of a suit only considering a preliminary point? Yes. Let's assume yeah. he takes a plea of res judicata. Let's assume a plea. No, res judicata, res judicata, because the difference is that res judicata is not a pure question of law. It is a vexed question of fact and law. Because res judicata has to be decided with reference to some previous litigation. Whether such a previous litigation exists or not is a question of fact. So once that is established as a question of fact, then whether it will apply as res judicata is a question of law. No, I'm saying if it is, it has and it becomes self-explicit to the effect. Sometimes even I've seen the plaints are exactly the same, except for one or two different aspects. Once it is rejected, I'm saying in that qu uh, question he's asking. Or let's assume it is totally barred by jurisdiction, only on those issues. No, ba barred by jurisdiction, I'm, see, I can give you an example. Res judicata, you, you uh, refer to commentaries on section 11 by Mullah or any standard textbook you will find that it is a rule of evidence, actually. Restudicata is a rule of evidence. And it is, uh, you will find in Evidence Act also, uh, 40 to 40, 42, 43, sections 41, 40, 41, 42, these are all principles of extension of Restudicata principle. Restudicata confined to CPC section 11. And because, mind you, one thing, Restudicata beyond uh, section 11 is also available. In the case of repetitions, section 11 is not applicable, but still the principles of general principles of res judicata applies. So res judicata is a matter which has to be established regarding the existence of a previous litigation between the same parties and the issue in the first uh, litigation is substantially the same as the issue in the second litigation. Now, these are all aspects to be established in a trial. And uh, you can't simply assume that, yes, this is the first case is also between the same parties and the same subject. The, the matter directly and substantially arising in the first case is also same as this matter in the second suit. In the number, that you can't assume, which requires proof. That is why I say it is a settled proposition in law that res judicata is a vexed, mixed question of fact and law. It is not a pure question of law. Yeah. What well, repetition? There are a lot of petitions. One was on the, uh, you would be remembering that Nawab Hussain uh -huh. versus Union of India, 77 Supreme Court, correct, 288. Correct, correct. It said correct. that after dismissal of the red petition, the civil suit could not have died. That, that exactly is the difference. If you confine to section 11 CPC, that, that because that is in a suit, how do you decide things in a suit based on evidence? In the case of red petitions, you decide things on affidavit. Yeah. That is the difference. Yeah. We also have a, a full bench of Punjab and I could, Teja Singh versus UT. 81 Supreme Court, uh, 81 Punjab and Haryana, page 1, PLJ, which says that uh, the trappings of res judicata sector will come into being in a red petition. Correct. And it also, there are also a lot of judgments which says that once there is an effect, uh, it is silent, then even in that aspect, you can look into the affairs. It is. Yes, yes. Now, I think Dilip's question, I find a question from Dilip, uh, whether if it's a mixed question of fact and law, can it be decided as a preliminary point? No is my answer for that question. Yeah, yeah. Right, sir. Uh, so thank you, everyone. Stay safe, stay blessed. And tomorrow we have sessions on the sanctity of the private mediation. So do join with us. Mr. AJ Jawad and Mr. Atul Lakhanpal will be taking a session tomorrow at 5 p.m. Okay. Everyone stay safe. Thank you. Stay